Well, first, thank you very much. Thank you to, to all of you for this uh, warm welcome. I'm very uh, happy to be, to be here. It's my first time in Cornell. And uh, as a <coughs> foreigner who lives in New York, Manhattan, and in fact, I don't know as much about the, the, U, the rest of the US as I should. So I take every opportunity to discover the rest of the country. And it's a great uh, opportunity that you are giving me uh, today, thanks to Cornell University and to the, uh, uh, also the uh, uh, Humphrey Fellow uh, program for, for this invitation and for following up on uh, the first encounter we had at the, UN, at the UN, sorry, in, it was I think last year, in fall last year when the whole group came to visit the United Nations and showed interest in our work um, <coughs> and took this initiative to, to follow up on it. So it's for us very important and very encouraging to, uh, to see that what we are doing um, has interest and that is not only an interest by the moment, but it also leads to some follow-up activities. So that's that, thanks very much uh, to, to you uh, for that. Um, if I say that, it, that you know, sometimes we, we, we doubt also about the, the, uh, the relevance of our activities, or, or not, uh, not, uh, not about the relevance, but we, sometimes we have doubts about how it's perceived by the outside world and uh, uh, the importance that people attach to it. Um, uh, but I'm very impressed by the, the, the here the, the awareness and the knowledge about the MDGs that you already have. Uh, we usually speak to uh, audiences that are much uh, less knowledgeable on, uh, on this issue, so I maybe have to reshift a bit my presentation as I speak to adjust to your already quite uh, solid uh, knowledge of the, of the issue. Um, so first, with the general assessment on the, on the MDGs, I would say that the, um, as a whole, you know, the MDGs has been a very, um, a, a very a positive uh, aspect, a component of the work of the United Nations. Uh, the UN has worked in the development field uh, for uh, many years, or, uh, since in fact the organization was established. But until, until the MDGs, it worked mostly, first of course on projects at the field level, but at the global level, at the intergovernmental level, it worked on um, resolutions, on finding common grounds on policies which were negotiated and took the form of resolutions most of the time. Um, with the MDGs, we had for the first time a, a set, a limited set of goals that were universal and therefore had um, uh, a value being easily, uh, easy to communicate uh, to and for people to buy in and to actually have a, a global point of references for, 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 for everyone. So it was, it, was, um, it, it was a turning point in a way, in the way the organization functions in terms of uh, uh, setting priorities and uh, outreaching to the, to the world in general. And many of these, um, several of these, of these goals, in fact, have, have worked. Uh, the assessment is balanced, uh, as the professor said, um, but some have worked. And of course, the, 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 the first one is that um, the proportion of people living in extreme poverty, which is you know, the first uh, MDG, uh, has been halved, uh, halved, diminished by half at the global level. Uh, this is, uh, that, was, that was the first MDG, it has been reached. Uh, on the, uh, the, 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 the reduction in the number of people living in extreme poverty has been particularly significant uh, in, uh, in Asia, uh, in China, in India, in big, uh, you know, um, very populated countries. So as a result, in volume, the number of people, uh, because of the progress made in these countries, uh, at the global level, the number of people uh, living in extreme poverty, extreme poverty meaning with less than a dollar and 25 cents per day, uh, has been reached. Um, 
And, um, and that's not the only uh, field in which uh, progress, significant progress have been made. Uh, for example, in terms of access to uh, improved sources of drinking water, uh, the uh, over two billion people gained access to improved in, um, uh, sources of drink, drink, drinking for, uh, water from 1990 to 2010. So this MDG target um, that, that was included so in the, in the MDG agenda has been reached and it was reached in, 19, in uh, 2010, so five years ahead of schedule. So um, uh, we can we can see that progress are uh, you know are possible are tangible. Uh, I would take a third example, which is also I think very significant. It is it's in the health sector with the very remarkable gains that have been made in the fight against um, malaria, tuberculosis, and I would also say uh, HIV/AIDS. Um, uh, so. Uh, you know, communicable diseases, uh, where progress are very uh, concrete um, in terms of the malaria, it's, uh, in, in terms of tuberculosis, it's particularly significant. In terms of, um, of malaria, um, the, the progress are also there, in, in particular in Africa, where it's, it's, a, it's a major uh, problem. Uh, and also, you know, in terms of, uh, as, for, as far as uh, HIV AIDS is concerned, the, the curb of infection has now reached the peak and is starting to diminish. So there are uh, real improvements. And these improvements came because also there was a very strong international mobilization and very important funds put, you know, <coughs> to, 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 uh, to cover and to finance the activities, development activities. Funds that were not necessarily channeled through the UN. It can be by development agencies, by other mechanisms for you know, communicable diseases. There is a global fund, which is not a UN institution, but which has attracted a lot of money and, um, and which has very much linked its work to the UN development goal and the UN activities on HIV AIDS. So we are not pretending to be you know, a central government uh, setting the norm and doing everything to reach, uh, you know, agreement. We are more setting the norm, the, the, the objective, and creating a momentum around it. And uh, uh, results, you know, have been there. Uh, it is all the more, I think, significant as this took place in a difficult context. In a difficult context for two main reasons. First, the continued population growth. Um, a population that's continued to grow uh, in a very uh, marked, important uh, way in the, in, the, in the 20 years or 25 years of the MDG experience. Uh, we have reached 7 billion inhabitants in the planet um, <coughs> two years ago. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, and we will probably by 2050 reach 9 billion. So we are still at a time of big uh, demographic expansion. And this is, um, I think, uh, a challenge because, of course, even if you reduce uh, sta stati uh, statistically uh, the, the rate of people uh, who live in poverty or um, suffer from hunger, still the volume of people uh, who suffer uh, from that is remain very high. Um, so it's not easy to keep a momentum around this when you know the needs uh, continue to increase in terms of the number of people you need to support. Uh, <coughs> so the, the, the population growth so has, has, has been a constraint but not an obstacle to the momentum around these goals. And I think it's an important issue. And the second main constraint that I wanted to, to mention is the economic and financial crisis of 2008-2009, a, um, a major crisis of the global financial system, of the US financial system, and then of the global financial system, and um, which has really uh, uh, created a lot of constraints on national budgets for development assistance. Um, that's, that has been uh, the, 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 the all people working in the development field were very worried about the consequences 
that uh, that this crisis would would have on you know the, the even at some point the, the continuity or the relevance of uh, monitoring these goals because uh, there, there were really question marks on whether um, uh, states could continue to fund it in a, in, in a meaningful way. But in fact they have. Despite the crisis, uh, official development assistance has been reduced but has not been reduced dramatically. Uh, the, the policies have continued to exist and it is quite broadly recognized in decision-making <coughs> spheres, you know, at the governmental level, that the MDGs have been instrumental in keeping the momentum and in keeping the allocation of these funds because you had a global figure to reach and you could not really escape for it. You had to show the commitment and to deliver in, in concrete terms. And that has been important both for developed and for developing countries, in fact. Um, uh, and I, we had, you know, several encounters with the uh, representatives from development cooperation agencies from, from all over the world. And it's a common assessment that they make, you know, without this joint global uh, agenda, uh, official development assistance, or ODA, would have been much probably uh, reduced uh, co considerably. Uh, the UN could keep an international momentum around these issues uh, in, um, thanks to this, uh, this MDG agenda. Well, that's for the bright picture. But I, I, I'm aware about the challenges and the limits to the limitations to what I've said. And um, among the continued challenges uh, that exist, um, I would um, there are many, but I would I would mention um, two or three of them. First is the um, the issue of environmental sustainability. Uh, environment sustainability is an MDG. There is this uh, MDG number seven uh, with some targets, you know, okay, w w which so it has been integrated into the program. But in spite of that, you know, uh, the, M the MDG has remained a bit more, too much of a statement of principle and environmental sustainability and not enough action oriented. Um, and the reality is, is not, uh, good. Uh, environmental sustainability is under sever severe threat um, and um, uh, for example the, in terms of uh, um, uh, global uh, uh, emissions you know the, 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 the they have continued to accelerate uh, and they are even 46 percent higher today than they were in 1990. So um, the, uh, the gas emissions are, are very high. Forests have continued uh, to be, uh, you know, quite significantly reduced uh, in terms of the, of the, the surface of forest uh, areas that are properly managed. Um, also, the overexploitation of maritime resources are a significant issue. So all the environmental dimension has not been helped that much by the MDG agenda. Uh, and of course, um, the climate change issues is is uh, is a major component of that. So, what um, the UN it's I, the UN has not, you know, been inactive on this, uh, but it has been it has worked on this issue a bit in a parallel way to the main NG MDG program. Uh, there have been there has been a major conference in Rio, uh, the, the, the Earth Summit, 20 years after the first Rio conference of 1992. It was held two years ago. Uh, big commitments, uh, um, uh, some concrete uh, measures, but you know the. Um, it was not fully integrated into the MDG uh, uh, agenda. It hasn't been until now. So first um, major challenge, environmental sustainability is not there as it should be. The second one, inequalities. Inequalities persist and uh, they are at very, very high level. Um, inequalities at various levels. First, uh, inequalities, inequalities among regions of the world. Um, I mentioned the issue of the, uh, you know, the uh, reduction in extreme poverty. 
extreme poverty has been uh, reduced in Asia, for example, the, 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 the rates, you know, went from, uh, in China it was from 60% uh, of population living in extreme poverty uh, in the late 80s, now the figure is 12%, so huge reduction. Uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia also, in South Asia also a, a marked reduction. In Africa, it, the progress are, are much slower. Uh, reduction of extreme poverty in, Afri in Africa has reduced from 56% to 48%, 56 to 48. So you see it's not the rhythm, the momentum that has been, um, uh, that we have uh, witnessed in, um, in Asia, f far from that. And as a result, uh, you know, in the world at the global level, and you mentioned this figure, one out, uh, out of eight person remain uh, chronically uh, unnourished. Uh, so major inequalities still in the world. Inequalities also um, in, um, among urban and rural areas. Uh, it is um, clear that the, the world population has become um, urban. The majority of the, of the world population is urban now. The switch has been done, I think, three or four years ago. It's quite recent, but we are already in this, in this uh, dynamic. Uh, but rural urban gaps persist, um, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the figures are quite clear, for example, in terms of uh, uh, you know, maternal health, which is one of the, uh, of the, uh, of the M MDGs. Um, people living in rural areas, uh, women living in rural areas uh, are, um, can access uh, health care and, for example, skilled health personnel for, 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 preg for uh, uh, pregnancies and deliveries. 53% in rural areas 84%, 84% in urban areas in the, in, in, in the, at the global level. So you can see much more access to services in urban rather uh, instead of rural areas. So the, the, this, this gap between uh, rural and urban areas is still very uh, significant. And the thinking about um, you know, sustainable development now completely includes both dimensions, meaning that urban development should also be, there should be a continuity between, a continuum between uh, urban, su sustainable urbanization and rural development, so has to uh, close as much as possible this gap that is being uh, witnessed. And um, I would say also that you know inequalities uh, remains also uh, gender inequality also remain uh, at all levels. <laughs> Let's say um, I mentioned maternal health. <coughs> maternal health. The ratio of uh, maternal uh, mortality has declined over the last two decades. <coughs> but the target of reducing it by three quarters, which is included in the MDGs, will not be reached. Uh, it will probably be, be reached uh, by, uh, it may be reached by half, which is already significant, but not by three quarters. And given you know, the very, in a way, basic uh, need that uh, uh, maternal health uh, is, uh, having not been able to reach the objective, I think, is a global failure, um, which requires much, 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 much more to be done. Now, in this uh, post-2015 program, uh, what should it aim at and uh, how should it, in broad terms, be, um, be be worked out, be elaborated. Um, this process of elaborating a post-2015 development agenda is ongoing. Uh, negotiations are taking place <coughs> in New York uh, on a continuous basis for over a year now. And um, there is, has been a big consultation process 
at, you know, development agencies of the UN, I've consulted people in the field, uh, there has been online communication, a big participatory process. It's we're still in the phase of countries and also civil society organizations expressing their views and uh, their, their ambitions for the uh, for post-2015 development agenda. Um, and the negotiations at the intergovernmental level will start in September of this year with a view to be ready for adoption of the next program in September 2015, where there will be in New York a summit of heads of state and governments as we do on a regular basis. Uh, but in 2015, we'll be the main one uh, at the highest political level for the adoption of the post-2015 uh, agenda. Um, it, is a, it, is a bit, uh, um, it is a bit difficult to, well, you know, speaking about what, what it will look like is a bit of speculation on my side. And I understand I have to sign a paper saying that I authorized, uh, you know, my words to be quoted after this seminar. <laughs> so, so I hope I will not put myself in a difficult situation. I will not regret it. Afterwards. I will try to give you some elements, you know, of what it can be without, of course, you know, anticipating or, or speaking for the intergovernmental process, which has not even really started in terms of actual <coughs> negotiations of the agenda. It will start in September. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we can already draw some general uh, you know, ideas about, uh, uh, about what, what it will look like or what it may look like. Uh, first, um, the ideas that prevail in the discussion um, are the following. There is um, a willingness to build on the existing MDGs and to build on the legacy of the MDGs. Meaning, as I said at the very beginning, you know, all in all, this MDG program has been an added value of the UN, which has managed to rally all development actors to make the Red Bank work more closely to the, uh, to the UN, to involve development agencies. So um, there will, be, I, it, it, it seems, and I'm cautious there, but you, you will un understand the, the, the reasons, but it seems that um, the, 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 the legacy of the MDGs in terms of, of having a limited set of goals and uh, with specific targets and indicators, this overall idea will remain. Uh, there, will be, there will be, again, a limited uh, number of goals with uh, specific targets and indicators. And a uh, second aspect of the legacy of MDGs, poverty reduction is expected to remain the goal number one. Some people speak about the unfinished business of the MDGs. It's not a very nice expression, but you know, at least it says what it said. We, there has been a momentum, but results are not all there, so we have to continue on, on, on that trend and, and keep the momentum around it. So a limited number of goals uh, and poverty reduction as the goal number one. Uh, and I would say even the poverty reduction issue is gaining a lot of importance because of these inequalities that I've mentioned. And the understanding uh, by politicians um, that, you know, inequalities as the so are, are, are the source of tensions, political tensions, uh, social tensions. And I think it's an interest by all now today's world to reduce the gaps, uh, including in the interest of politicians themselves. So, um, uh, so um, from, you know, from there, the, um, the, the, the legacy of the MDG will, will be there, but there are new challenges that will be most probably included, integrated in the new program. First, and I refer to it, uh, the issue of um, the integration of sustainable development and the connection between the 
socio-economic, socio-demographic component of the MDG program that we have. We have in the MDGs, you know, the issue of access to education, maternal health, major disease, poverty, hunger. This, this socio-economic issue, issue with the environmental dimension that, as I said, has been a bit until now dealt in a different track at the UN with the climate change uh, conferences, with the, the Rio, uh, Rio uh, process, um, and, and therefore having conciliating, you know, on the development agenda and the environmental agenda. Um, that's what we call in the, uh, <coughs> you know, UN or international jargon today, the integration of the three dimensions of sustainable development, the economic, the social and the environmental dimension of sustainable development, which are to be uh, considered together. Uh, we know that for countries it is difficult to make trade-offs between the need for economic growth, uh, the request for more social uh, protection and the need to protect the environment. But this is a major aspect of what uh, public policy making is today. How do you conciliate these three dimensions? To which dimension do you give priority? But how do you answer to social needs for others? Uh, these trade-offs, this compromise, these are at the heart of policy making in today's world. And it needs to be also reflected at the global level. And probably also, you know, the UN has a role to play in analyzing uh, how this is, is, is managed at the, at the, at the national level, uh, how uh, this is uh, uh, taken on board and to draw lessons learned, do some comparative uh, research of public policies from that standpoint of the integration of the three dimensions of, of sustainable development. It will the, 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 the next development agenda will need to reflect on that and of course in the environmental dimension of it, the big question is whether we will be in a position to set sustainable development goals. So goals that also refer uh, well to, to the social dimension, we already have some, but also to uh, economic, uh, economic growth with objectives in terms of uh, employment, for example, creation of, uh, of jobs, uh, and at the environmental level on biodiversity, uh, on reduction of gas emissions, that's, that would be the ideal, you know, framework. If we can have goals with targets on, on these various, on these three dimensions. Will we reach it? Will, can we politically, you know, get the commitment? Early to say. But that's the, the, the coherence that we aim at and that we want at the, at the UN. Uh, second, as second element that I wanted to draw your, your attention on is the issue of universality versus differenti differentiation at the, at the national level. Um, universality uh, is, you know, by nature, uh, the spirit in which the UN works. We are, we are there to create global consensus, uh, for sure. The, the limit the, of the exercise is that when you are too global, then you are not relevant enough in relation to the conditions prevailing in countries. What, how to reach a global uh, objective and still make something relevant, to make it relevant at the national level and measurable at the national level. Uh, statistically, you know, uh, th that's that's a major that's a major issue. And a lot of thought have been put into into this, and uh, the idea now, as it stands, is to is to continue with universal goals, but then probably to make a differentiation in terms of targets and indicators, depending on the level of de of development of the various countries and the situation. Uh, in, in which they are and the, 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 the level of development that they reach in, in the various, in the various goals. <coughs> Universality in the overall objective, but differentiation in terms of targets. I just wanted to give you an example of a proposal made. It's absolutely not something that has been 
uh, you know, agreed upon by the internal process, but it's an illustration of how one can conciliate universal goal and differentiation. There's been a proposal by a think tank <coughs> I think on the uh, how to, um, to, to, to conciliate this um, uh, universality in goal and, and, and differentiation at the national level on the issue of maternal mortality. You know, one, again, I think of, of um, a very fundamental goal in which more needs to be done. Um, <coughs> the evidence on, um, you know, the experience of the last two decades uh, you so have shown that um, the uh, maternal mortality rate was relatively high for countries with higher levels, higher initial levels of, ma of maternal mort mortality, but relatively, relatively low for countries with medium rates of maternal death. As a result, what is proposed is that, uh, you know, um, uh, some reference points to assess sustainable progress towards this goal uh, could be set with, for example, countries with over 530 maternal health per 100,000 live births would have the commit take the commitment to reduce ma maternal mortality by 32%, which is an, an achievable goal, uh, so between 2015 and 2030, while countries with a kind of uh, uh, medium uh, rate, so you know, between 530 maternal deaths, uh, with over, sorry, uh, with between 110 and 530, sorry, would uh, reduce maternity mortality by 25 percent, and uh, those with a lower level of uh, maternal mortality rate, for example, between 28 and, and, and 110, would have the commitment to reduce it by 62 percent because they, they have the means already to. Uh, to, to, to make substantive progress. So depending on the rates prevailing in the countries to adjust, you know, it would, uh, uh, the, the program would, would adjust, the goal would, the targeted would be adjusted with specific rates or specific pace of progress, if you want, um, uh, defined um, uh, accordingly. And, you know, for developed countries, because after all, you know, these goals are not only for developing countries. And uh, it is also our view at the UN that it should not be only considered as something for, for developing countries. First, you know, what's a developed country? What's a developing country? The borderline is not that clear any longer. Uh, the word is not that, you know, bipolar as it, as it, as it was. There is, there is much more uh, diversity and uh, each country you know, experience problems. So um, uh, for countries, you know, which have uh, very low maternal mortality rate, 128 per 100,000 live births, then, you know, the, the, the goal could be to, to uh, uh, to reach it to below 13, which is achievable, um, and with an objective of zero uh, preventable maternal deaths by 2030. So, uh, you know, adapting to, um, to, 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 to the conditions prevailing there. Um, when I <coughs> made the reference to uh, the issue of developed countries, uh, I, I see it also in my own country when you talk to politicians, you know, and I ha we had a meeting with the interna in International Parliamentary Union at the UN uh, uh, at the end of last year, uh, and the parliamentarians from, from uh, developed countries and fr from the European one, for example, we knew about the MDGs but considered it was very much a developing country issue. That was not there, you know, it was, it was interesting. They, they had been, they'd learned about it, they have, but it's, they, they don't own it, you know, in, in many ways. Uh, in the next post-development uh, agenda, if we have sustainable development objectives, for example, with the environmental dimension, it really is very important for developed countries to fully get engaged in that and to consider it as an objective, you know, and adopt policy references, policy, uh, uh, policies that will allow to reach this objective because basically they are the main polluters, you know. Uh, and also in terms of, of extreme poverty, there is extreme poverty in the industrialized world. Uh, let's not, you know, consider that it's not an, uh, just an issue for, uh, for developing countries. There is 
uh, more awareness, I think, to raise in the developed world as well, in as much as, you know, uh, who is developed, who is emerging, who is developing, who is least developed countries. The categories are so numerous these days that I, th I think that the, uh, the various categorization uh, becomes sometimes a bit, uh, uh, a bit artificial and if we really want to have a global momentum, everyone needs to, 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 to be on board. Um, <coughs> a fourth challenge that I wanted to mention in is the issue of uh, governance. Governance, human rights, but mostly governance. There was, there was a proposal by <coughs> many actors to have a goal on human rights, on governance, sorry, uh, in, in a new uh, million development goals and improving uh, governance. Uh, it could include targets such as, such as the perception of corruption, you know, for example, in, uh, by, by, public, uh, by the public, like this index that is produced by the NGO uh, Transparency International, which has a ranking you know, of all countries of the world. It could include also the, um, you know, the, the level of uh, competencies given to local authorities as opposed to, to centralized uh, government. It could include many things. It's these are just you know, proposals. <coughs> but on the governance discussion is, is a difficult one at the UN. There has been traditionally a divide between um, it has been between the north and the south. Even though this also, you know, it certainly be uh, rethought and uh, uh, may not be the case in future. But traditionally, there was this divide because developed countries and donor countries, those who fund development assistance programs, have usually asked a lot of governance reform to recipient countries and therefore been very demanding on that. And developing countries traditionally have said, yes, we have to do reform, but improved governance should also be a major global issue and there should be more, better governance of international organizations, a more just and equitable uh, economic or uh, institutional order, you know, uh, more uh, to s have more uh, voice, you know, uh, in the in the decision making process at the international levels, in the international financial institutions, uh, etc. Uh, so um, this this divide and this this ongoing debate has never been completely solved. And it is therefore rather difficult uh, to um, reach a consensus uh, on this. But the next post-2015 development agenda is an opportunity to try again. And we will see what will com comes up out of it. I really wouldn't bet anything <laughs> on that. But, uh, you know, there will be, uh, it's on the table at least, and it's being discussed. And it's important that both both aspects, you know, the need for better administration, decision-making processes at the national level, but also how international institutions function, how this is uh, this is really uh, taken on board by the by the the countries, and this leads me to the to the last aspect, which is uh, you know this new global partnership for development that the post 2015 agenda will also embody. Um, in the current MDG program, there is what is called MDG 8, the last one, on the Global Partnership for Development, commitments by country to give um, more official development assistance, um, to lower the debt burden of developing countries, and that has been, there has been progress on that uh, in, in many countries. Uh, commitments also for um, um, uh, international trade system that is more fair and equitable. Also progress on that standpoint. Most production, 80% now of products from developing countries, access markets of developed countries with no um, uh, tariffs, you know, with, uh, and uh, uh, quotas. Uh, so that's also, there have been progress. 
But uh, this being said, you know, the um, overall objective set by the UN of 0.7% of GDP of countries being allocated to official development assistance has never been reached. Only five countries, I think now, uh, have res respected and followed up on their commitment uh, to allocate 0.7% of their GDP to official development assistance. So, you know, still a lot to be done. And um, the post-2015 development agenda is a, a, an opportunity to have, uh, to, to define uh, a global partnership for development um, that is, needs to be ambitious, especially if we include issues like, you know, environmental goals uh, or uh, uh, creation of employment um, or on maternal health or other health issues, a real uh, willingness to move forward, uh, then it needs to be ambitious and it to, for it to be serious and to be taken seriously by the various partners, uh, there is a need for a strong accountability mechanism. So follow-up follow up mechanisms uh, that will have to be put in place at the UN probably, but you know, uh, once again, the UN do not own the own process. If that's taken up at the level of the G20, at the level of other financial institutions, I think that would be fine with the UN people because the important thing is that the issue is really being seriously worked upon and it can be and it should be in various frameworks, in various decision-making circles. Um, the, the, the accountability mechanism uh, should, should lead and that's I think an op we have an opportunity, uh, an opportunity here to really make a qualitative, uh, you know, jump, uh, uh, leapfrog in the uh, in in the way uh, relations among states are being made. We have the opportunity to put in place mechanisms where uh, the, uh, the 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 mutual accountability between donor countries and recipient countries are really put on the table and. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the uh, what is expected and what is given is um, uh, discussed, reviewed in a much more transparent uh, way that is ad ad has been the case uh, until now. Um, this opportunity can, uh, I think, there will be progress made on that because there is uh, there is a political will to improve the overall relations between. Uh, between the, uh, <coughs> countries, donor countries, recipient countries, emerging donors. Um, and for that also, this accountability mechanism will need to not only be intergovernmental, but involve uh, the civil society and the private sector. Private sector is increasingly, and I th this is appears quite quickly at the UN, considered as an important actor to uh, to play a role and to play its part in the development agenda. Many uh, private sector um, you know, many companies are, are involved, but it's not as systematic as we would like, and there are new forms of partnership that need to be developed. Um, so, um, um, flexible, but still, you know, uh, well-established mechanism for follow-up. That's what we would aim at, and of course the UN hopes that uh, it will have its role in the process uh, will be enhanced uh, with uh, uh, through this more, um, you know, solid, robust, uh, constructive mechanisms. And if the MDGs, you know, which are not, you know, that old. 2000, just adopted in the year 2000, can lead by 2030 uh, to a mechanisms where uh, the commitments for support are, are, and, and the actions done are really put in a transparent way on the table of international negotiations. I think in 30 years' time, we will have made real, real progress in terms of uh, building the international order that we, that we all want. Uh, it's on this note of hope that I will stop uh, the conversation, but I'm ready to answer questions, of course. <laughs>